Good evening, everyone. We are going to be starting in uh, just about two or three minutes. Uh, so thanks for joining us here on time. Uh, in the meantime, just to keep us entertained, I am going to launch a really quick poll just so that we can get to know each other a little bit better. So please sit tight, please answer this poll, and uh, we are going to start in just two to three minutes. So again, thanks for joining us. We're going to be starting in just a minute. In the meantime, please answer this question in a poll and we are going to start in just a minute. All right, on my watch, it's seven o'clock Eastern time and we will start our class. So congratulations again for joining us tonight to learn about the verbal section of the GMAT. We are still waiting for some people to join, but we're actually not going to wait for them. We are going to begin. Thanks so much for sharing a little bit more about you. Uh, this really helps me understand where you are right now and um, will help me answer some of your questions as well. All throughout this seminar, you can keep putting questions. If this question is a little more immediate, please put that question in a chat box. And if that's the question that you would like us to answer at some point throughout this seminar, then please put it in the Q&A box. The seminar is going to be recorded. So for whichever reason you have any technical difficulties, we are going to share this seminar recording with you at the end. We also at the end are going to have a special guest. It is going to be Teresa Perez from the Smith School of Business who is going to share with you a few tips on how you can prepare a good application, especially during these challenging times when the applications to the majority of the schools are actually going out. Now I'm going to end the polling right now because I don't want us to get distracted. And what I'd like to do is actually make sure that you come here to learn something. I am sure that if I ask you, why did you come here? You'll say, well, I want to learn something valuable. Now, learning involves getting a little outside of a comfort zone, especially when it comes to the GMAT. If I were to ask you something you already know, and you don't really have to think too much about it, then chances are you're not really going to learn much. The only way for you to learn is for me to give you something that will require you to really think a little hard about this. And of course, how are we going to do this? 
is I'm going to be giving you some GMAT challenges. They are all going to be related tonight to the verbal section of the GMAT. So my goal is to keep you in the learning zone over the next almost two hours. And if you find yourself in a panic zone, please don't run away. Wait until we break this question down. But the most important thing is if a question looks very overwhelming, try to understand the question and then finding an answer is going to be a little bit easier. So let's talk about our first question. This is going to be a critical reasoning question. I'm going to show you the question and a passage in a moment, and I'll give you about 45 seconds or so to think about this question and see if you can make any sense of it. Here is the question. I'm gonna stay quiet for about 45 seconds. All right, so that has been approximately 45 seconds. Now, I'm not going to ask you what the answer is since I haven't shown you the answers yet, but I would like to ask you this question. After reading this passage, who can honestly say, and please put it in the chat box, that you really understand what this passage is saying? You really, really understand this. And don't be shy, it's, uh, it's okay. I noticed uh, some of you raised your hand, so just please put things in the chat box. All right, uh, now, thanks for sharing this. Let me ask you, and yeah, too complicated. Uh, it's, it's a little bit convoluted. Now, let me ask you an, maybe a simpler question. How many of you read this more than once? Maybe you can put it in the chat box. Over these 45 seconds, how many times did you actually read this passage? Three times, four times? Oh, perfect, uh, definitely more than once, twice, and the bolded section twice, and three times, and I don't really understand it, right? And again, if you are raising your hand, if you could please just put things in the chat box just so we know how we can help. Uh, and after reading these three times, unfortunately, we still don't really understand what this passage is saying. Well, don't worry, this is a multiple choice exam, so I am going to show you the right answer right now. Now, here is the right answer. Uh, and four wrong answers. I'm not gonna tell you which one is which for now, but uh, try to see if you can find the right answer here among these five. I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds or so. All right, let me share the results with you. So if you would like to choose an answer, just please choose right now. Otherwise, I'm going to stop. Let me share with you. By the majority vote, it looks like E is the right answer. Now, I know some of you mentioned that I would like to see the passage again. Uh, what this means, however, is after reading the passage two or three times, you would like to go back and read this passage again. Uh, so this may or may not be necessary, but I will show you this passage again. Here is the passage. 
And as you probably remember, most of us read this passage more than once. I personally read, read this passage actually well over a hundred times. And if you ask me, what is this passage really saying? I probably wouldn't be able to tell you because this is a passage that's an argument created by a person whose profession is an ethicist. So who's an ethicist? That is a person who studies ethics. Uh, so if I were to ask you, uh, you're trying to get into a business school, do you need to be an expert in the field of ethics? What do you think? Probably not. Uh, I think you have to be ethical to get into a business school. That's important, but you don't have to be an expert in ethics. So as most of you were reading this passage, most of the people are reading this passage, they're really trying to understand something we don't understand because this is how we normally read. Uh, our brain is designed that we've been trained in school to read for things and understand things that we don't understand yet. This is how we learn. Right? Now, unfortunately for the GMAT, we are going to have to relearn the way we approach questions. And in this specific example, the question wasn't asking us anything about ethics. If you read the question, you would say there's a statement, a certain words in boldface. What role do these words play in the argument? If you want to understand the role of the statements, you want you would need to understand the relationship between the different statements in the argument, and not necessarily the what the content of the statement. So essentially, what we need to understand is the structure of the argument, because the structure will give us that relationship between the different statements. And if you're looking for just the structure of the argument, this is as much as you need to understand. Notice how this person began by saying it would be a mistake to say something. That is one of the ways to make a claim in an argument. That is why that first part, that first statement, until the words for although, is actually a claim of an argument. Now, when I'm making a claim, it would be helpful, especially if the claim is the disagreement with someone else, it would be helpful logically for me to explain why I'm actually disagreeing with these people. So I need to provide some evidence. And what follows would actually be the evidence. That part in bold is the part of that evidence, is the part of my reasoning if I were this ethicist. You would also notice that the first few words of that bolded part are for although this is true or for although it is true so what can we pull from this is that the author presents us an evidence that he or she agrees with and even though he or she disagrees with these people who are making a mistake it's okay to agree with a part of the argument and that's exactly what's happening here so here's what we've learned so far. We begin with a claim, we then support this claim by an evidence that we agree with as ethicists. Let's see if this analysis will help us un answer this question. Notice how we didn't really talk about ethics at all. We actually don't need to. Let's look at the answer choices. There are five answer choices. Uh, so we can start with anyone. I just like to start with C because I know what's coming. So for the purposes of our discussion, let's start with C. Uh, because C says, it is a faulty claim. So that part in bold is a faulty claim. What do you think about this answer choice? Would this be a good answer choice for us to pick? What do you think? Just please put it in the chat box. Do you think this is a good answer choice to pick? If it says, this is a faulty claim. Yeah, you're absolutely right. No, because these words said, although this is true. So C is actually out. And it's not a claim, actually. The claim was before it. Now, D says, it is according to the argument, a commonly held opinion that is nevertheless, oh, wait, false. We said it's true. So D is out. Let's look at E. Let's just keep going down. E says it reports an observation that the argument claims is, oh wait, false. I don't want false. 
I want true, E is out, I don't even have to read it. Now, here's what's, some, what's interesting. We are now down to two answer choices. So how many do we realistically have to read? What do you think? If we're down to two, how many do we have to read now? Do we need to read one or do we need to read both? Yes, you're absolutely right. We're going to read just one because if it's that one, then we're done. And if it's not that one, we're also done. It has to be the other one. Uh, I would like to read A because I'd like to save some time. I, it's not, I don't call this being lazy. I call this to be efficient. So let's read A. A says it is a claim for which the argument attempts to provide justification. Uh, well, was this really a claim that part and bolt? Uh, no, it was not a claim. The claim was before it. This was the support to the claim. So A is wrong, B is right, I am done. I have personally done this question well over a hundred times. Like I mentioned, I still can't really tell you what this was all about. Uh, so why was this part not a claim? Because the claim was before it. The claim was these people are wrong. They're making a mistake. As an ethicist, I'm right. I'm going to explain to you why. So we broke the argument down this way. We've understood the structure. We stripped it down to the bare bones. And that is why we knew that that part in bold isn't a claim, it's actually evidence. That's what helped us answer this question. We also knew it's true. That helped us get rid of C, D, and E. Now, how hard do you think is this question? I'm just curious, what do you think about this question? Is that an easy, medium, or difficult question? Or like easy to medium or medium to hard? What do you think? Difficult? Easy to medium. Okay, well, I'm glad you're thinking it's easy to medium. This is probably one of the hardest questions you will ever see on the GMA. This question is well in the 700 level. But as you could see, it's doable. It's hard, but it's doable because we knew what we're doing. And this is the trickiest part of the GMA. And that actually brings us to a very important point. And that point is what is this test all about? What is the GMAT all about? How can we actually deal with this test? Well, we'll keep on covering this all throughout this workshop. I'll, I'll give you more and more interesting things about the GMAT. Many of them are directly from the people who are creating these GMAT questions, who are creating this test. But this is a very important concept. And that is that the GMAT is not expecting that you know ethics. In fact, this is an exam to get into a business school. It does not accept how well you know business or how well you know molecular biology and even, believe it or not, how well you know math. Now, this is not a math workshop. We've done a math workshop two weeks ago and we'll do another math workshops in two weeks from now. But that's not really what, it's all, what the GMAT's all about. Instead, it is about you being able to demonstrate what the GMAT calls higher order reasoning skills. The skills are what really matters in the, actually everywhere, in the management classrooms and 21st century workplace. If I need to replace a pipe in my house, I want somebody who has a skill. I don't necessarily want somebody who has a knowledge. I want somebody who's actually able to do it. And that's true of almost everything. Now you will need to have some basic knowledge, don't get me wrong actually show you how basic it is. I'll give you another quote in a few minutes. Uh, but you do need to have some basic knowledge just so that you can demonstrate these different types of reasoning skills. Because we need to have some sort of a subject matter in order for us to demonstrate to the GMAT and to the business schools we are aspire to get into that we have these reasoning skills. Of course, who said this? People who created the test. Let's, we're starting to uncover uh, really what the GMAT's all about. And in fact, here's what we're going to be doing today. Uh, we'll talk about what everybody should know when you're studying for the GMAT or maybe even before you're studying for the GMAT. We'll talk about a couple of really important things that many people, when they begin studying for the GMAT, overlook. So if you know about these things, your success on the GMAT is going to be so much greater because many people don't. We'll, of course, talk about some of the important verbal concepts 
that you need to know. So there's going to be a little bit of a refresher of what you learned in school. And of course, we'll talk about some strategies. The GMAT isn't just about knowing English grammar. So we'll, we'll, I'll show you tonight certain strategies that you can use on the verbal section right now. Uh, we'll also talk about some of the traps that you definitely should not be getting into after this class. And at the end, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about successful MBA applications. And you actually hear insider tips from somebody who works at a business school. We often invite guest speakers towards the end to spend a few minutes to share some really valuable tips on the MBA in addition to the gym. Now, let me actually properly introduce myself. Uh, you've uh, seen a title slide, but my name is Sergey. I am a GMAT instructor with Admit Master. I have my MBA. I, in fact, have three university degrees, a Bachelor of Physics, a Master of Mathematics, and an MBA. So I've spent eight years studying at the university. I have done really well on the GMAT myself. I scored 750, and I've been teaching the GMAT for over 10 years right now. This, uh, the score of 750 is actually, uh, I know it, may sound impressive, and I'm certainly impressed. Uh, it was my uh, first and only attempt, uh, but my score is actually the lowest score of everybody who works for our company as GMAT instructors. Uh, I love the GMAT because it's a real skills-based exam. I, I have some other skills-based challenges. Usually in the summer, I sail a boat. Unfortunately, I can't do it right now. My boating club is still closed due, the, due to the uh, lockdowns. Uh, and uh, in the winter, I snowboard. And yes, I do love the GMAT. It always keeps challenging me. And I just love how it, uh, it challenges other people in a really good way to help them develop some amazing skills. Uh, I work with many people whom I consider way smarter than me. Like I said, I have the lowest score of everybody who works for us. Uh, and uh, this workshop really summarizes a lot of experience so this wasn't just something that I put together. Uh, many of our instructors who in total have over 70 years of experience between all of us, about four or five of us, uh, we've put together this workshop so you can learn things in about two hours. You can learn the most important things that you need to know about the GMAT. Uh, maybe we can start by reviewing really quickly the format of the exam and how the verbal section actually fits into this exam. I know for many of you, it's something you already know, so I'm not going to spend too much time, but I will be sure to show you something you don't know. Now, as I'm sure you know by now, the exam consists of four sections, the traditional test center exam. There'll be an essay. There'll also be a section that will ask you to deal with 12 very short business cases and their severe time pressure in half an hour. So very, very limited time per business case, certainly way less than what you may have ex been exposed to in school. Uh, there'll also be a section about math, which is about an hour. And there'll also be a section on verbal, which is a little bit more than an hour and slightly less than two minutes per question. In terms of the score, the total 200 to 800 score, that score depends only on how you do in the quant and verbal sections. The other two sections do not contribute towards your score. However, they are still submitted to the business schools. These schools will see your scores and they're certainly going to evaluate your application based on the entire score report from all four sections as well as the total score. Every score will also have a percentile score. What this means is that if you score, for example, in the 90th percentile, you have beaten 90% of people. Uh, on the GMAT, you were better than 90% of people. So it's certainly a very competitive exam. To achieve a high score, you need to perform better than many other people. Let's talk about the different types of the questions on the GMAT. In the quantitative section, there will be two question types, problem solving and data sufficiency. In the verbal reasoning section, there'll be three, sentence correction, critical reasoning, and reading comprehension. Both of these sections follow what's called the computer adaptive algorithm. So how does a computer adaptive algorithm work? Everybody is going to start from a question that's about a medium difficulty. If you're answering the questions right, the question difficulty is going to go down. So the question is essentially going to become easier. And if you answer the questions, uh, if you answer the questions wrong, and if you answer the questions right, the questions are going to keep getting harder. So 
the only way actually to do well on a test is to keep answering questions correctly so that you keep getting questions harder and harder and harder. And the level you achieve on those last questions is essentially going to be your score. Now, it looks pretty complicated at the essence. It's simple. You just need to keep answering the questions correctly for the difficulty to go up. Uh, this unfortunately does mean that you are going to see a lot of difficult questions, hopefully, on the test. That's really what you want to see because that is what's going to help you get a higher score. Now, I know many of you may have heard that the GMAT uses a special secret formula to calculate your score. Uh, and that is indeed true. Uh, there is a formula. It's actually not so secret. Uh, I know many people are uh, saying it's secret and nobody really knows how the scores are calculated. But uh, I've been to a conference that's put together by the GMAC um, every year, uh, especially for a select small group of test prep organizations that have been around for a while and um, that are in the GMAC's um, opinion are doing a good job preparing uh, their students for the GMAT. So I've been at uh, this uh, seminar or this conference uh, a few times. Uh, this is the actual formula that was shared with us at one of these seminars. Here's a formula. Now, uh, I know you might be looking at this and uh, say, how is it going to help me? Well, it's prob it probably won't. So let's just dissect it a little bit and understand what do I actually need to know about the way the scores are calculated. Here are important things to pull out of this. First of all, some questions on the GMAT are experimental. About 10% of quant and 20% of verbal questions are experimental, which means they do not count towards your total score and towards your score on that section. Uh, what's also really important is that the first 10 questions on the GMAT in each section are actually not more important. You may have thought that they are more important. They are not. However, there is a big penalty for unanswered questions at the end. If you don't manage your time well, and if you don't finish, you're going to be potentially penalized, not only for the questions you didn't finish, but also for the questions you did finish because you could have spent less time on these questions. And if you didn't finish on time, you've overspent your time on the earlier questions. So therefore, it's really, really important that you finish on time. So these are some of the very important things. Another very important thing to pull out of this is that the quant and the verbal sections are equally important when it comes to your total score. The GMAT doesn't favor quant, it doesn't favor verbal. So on a relative basis, they are 50-50. However, when you're looking at the exact scores, and quant and verbal, the scale of these scores is a little bit different. For example, a score of 40 on quant is actually not a very impressive score, but the score of 40 on verbal is a very impressive score. Fewer than 10% of people achieve that score. Now, I know many of you have probably heard about the online GMAT, that the exam could actually be taken in the online format. So what is the difference between the regular and the online exam. Well, the regular exam is a three and a half hour long exam, but the online is a little shorter because it's not taken at a test center, it's actually taken at home. They're both proctored in real time by live people. Of course, in a test center, they are proctored by people who are watching every test taker through a glass door, glass window, and online through a webcam. The regular exam is available almost any day of the week except for Sunday, but the online exam is actually available 24 seven. So you can take this exam in the middle of the night if you'd like. There are certain limits on the regular exam. For example, you can take it every, approximately every two weeks and there's a lifetime maximum of eight times for that exam. Hopefully none of you are getting close to this limit. However, the online exam can be taken only once. There are no maximums and the exam is available until June 15 only, at least for now. So it's, uh, it's once, and when I'm saying there are no maximums, what this means is that it does not contribute towards that maximum uh, for a regular exam. 
And so it's an extra, it's an additional exam. If you've taken the online exam, you actually can take a regular exam still eight times. I don't know why you would want to, but you can, because that score does not go on your regular GMAT report. We actually done a workshop about the online exam. If you are interested, you can find that workshop. Uh, we post it on YouTube and you can watch all the information about it. Uh, but just gonna give you one quick little thing about the structure. The regular exam could be taken in a variety of different section orders. For example, you can start with an essay or start with a verbal or start with a quant section. However, the online exam follows just one structure. You're going to have the quant section, then the verbal section with no break, then one five minute break, and then the IR section, which is essentially that section that deals with business cases. And there'll be a check-in process, which is approximately 15 minutes long. So your entire experience is going to be approximately three hours. Unlike the test center exam, you're not allowed to use any scrap paper or any uh, laminated noteboards, just like on a real, uh, on the test center a test. In the online test, you're going to be using an online notepad. It's kind of like a Microsoft Paint. It's really, really basic. You can draw some shapes, uh, some lines. You can also you put a text box inside that window. Uh, you can erase and use different colors, uh, but that's about as much as you can do. You also are going to have a calculator on both the in-person and online exams. However, only on the IR section. You don't get it on the quant section and certainly you don't need it on the verbal section. So now that we've learned a little bit more about the structure of the exam and we've even seen that secret formula, you might be wondering, this is all good, but what I really came here for is to answer this question. If I can mind read a little, I know I can't see you, but I can feel you on the other side of this workshop. You might be wondering, can I get a 700 plus GMAT score? You might also be wondering, how do I actually do this? Is that even possible and how do I do this? So let me share with you another big GMAT secret. And that is that anybody can get a score of 700 plus. That absolutely is possible. I have seen this a lot all throughout my career. Not everybody will get that score. Certainly not everybody who wants to get that score actually will, but anybody can, anybody has the capacity to achieve that score. So we'll talk about how, and we'll also talk about how not to, how not not to achieve this score. But if we were to go back and try to understand how most people are trying to study, I know you may have been there, and I certainly, I know that you may know people that may have been there, is when they're studying for the test, the first thing that comes to mind is hit the books. That's what we've done in college, that's what we've done in university, just hit the box, maybe the week before, the night before, the months before. We go to a bookstore and we say, I need some books. And we pick up some books. Maybe we pick up the GMAT official guide. So it seems like it's the best, it's official. Sometimes we go and ask their friends, what are some of the good books? And the friends would say, oh, these are good books. There's 10 of them, so they're gonna teach you a lot. Or maybe these are good books, or these are good books, or these are good books. And before you know it, you're so overwhelmed with books that many people, when they begin studying for the GMAT, actually give up. The books are great, but the books don't really give you everything that you need for this test. And many people, by reading the books, they memorize a lot of things, but then what they realize is on a test day, or even as they're doing practice tests, the questions are going to be different. So the knowledge of certain concepts isn't going to help them get that 700 plus score. It's really going to be that skill. And then what many people would do then at that point to say, ah, it's, it's not just the books. It, it's few people who actually get to that because uh, this is also official statistics from the GMAT is that of everybody who is thinking of doing the test, so somebody who would actually go on mba.com, create an account with the goal of one day taking that test, of all of these people, 
only 10% will actually do the test. I, I find it shocking, 10%. But I think what you realize is that that's um, true of a lot of things in life that many times 10% of people are the people who are actually achieving the results. So if hitting the books isn't going to be enough, what many people are going to say, oh, I just need to practice because practice makes perfect. You may have heard this, practice makes perfect, right? That is actually not true. Practice doesn't necessarily make perfect. What practice makes is it makes things permanent. The more you practice, the more ingrained things are going to become. Now, if you practice good skills, then you're going to keep developing good skills. If you practice bad skills and bad habits, they are going to become permanent and it's going to be really hard to root them out. So hitting the books, yeah, that's important, but it's just a small part of your preparation. Practice, also really important, as long as you practice good skills. So what is missing? What's really missing for many people that were preventing them from achieving 700 plus scores? Now, I know many people would say, I would like to get a 700 plus score. It's really important for me to get a 700 plus score. But realistically, again, that's official statistics. You can just go on mba.com and find it. Only about 10% of people will reach a score of 700 or more of the GMAT. It's actually 12%. So it's about 10%, give or take. So how do you actually get there? Well, there's a very simple answer. And the answer is, if you want results in the top 10%, if you do want to get that 700 plus score, all you need to do is do things differently from the other 90% of people. Just the fact that you even showed up for this seminar tonight already means you're doing things differently. The weather is really nice outside, at least where I am right now, but we're still here inside learning about the GMAT. Now we'll keep coming back to this and talk exactly what would be that different things. Uh, but just before we jump into our verbal section, I just want to give you another quote from the GMAC. And that is, what you need to know for the GMAT is not more than what is generally taught in secondary school classes. I know you may have heard that the GMAT tests high school curriculum. It's actually not exactly true. Most people just say this so they don't feel so bad. And we can say, maybe I didn't really pay attention in high school. Actually, it's a secondary school where the majority of the content is coming from. Believe it or not, there are certain question types on the GMAT that test curriculum from grade one of junior school, as basic as that. So when you're thinking about how I'm going to study for the test, remember, yeah, really anybody can read a book. We all went to secondary school, we all can learn a book. So what would I do need to do differently? Well, let's see. We're actually going to talk all throughout the remainder of this workshop tonight about the different ways of looking at the questions. I'm going to actually show you the different ways and then you can relate of how you are looking at the question and how you might want to look at the question at the end of this workshop. Let's begin by talking about sentence correction. Now, when we talk about sentence correction, we usually are talking about three ways of correcting a sentence. Firstly, we need to make sure in a sentence, the grammar is correct. Secondly, we need to make sure the sentence conveys the right meaning. And thirdly, the sentence has a good, straightforward, direct way of communication. Because the business language is the language of direct, understandable, clear communication. And that's exactly what sentence correction questions are trying to test. Are you able to communicate clearly and also, as you would notice in a moment, do you have enough of the attention to detail to notice the little differences, the little mistakes that the GMAT is gonna throw in so that you can choose the right answer and discard the wrong answer? Now, when we talk about grammar specifically, you might feel a little overwhelmed. It's just like something like really big hits you because the English language is a language where there are so many grammar rules. And because it's a language that was actually created out of many other languages, there's a little bit of French, a little bit of German, a little bit of Latin, 
then as we have a lot of grammar rules, we also have many exceptions, right? We say a child, but we don't say child, we say children. We say phenomenon, but we don't say phenomenons, we say phenomena. There are many exceptions. It feels overwhelming, but let me give you good news. That good news is you need to know only a small number of English grammar rules. In fact, how small? Nine rules, nine very important grammar rules will help you answer virtually every sentence correction question. And five of them will help you answer 80% of all sentence correction questions when it comes to the grammar part. Now, the most important and probably the most common rule that's tested in sentence correction is the rule of putting together a sentence, the skeleton of a sentence, in a certain specific way. So let's talk about this rule. Now, when you have a sentence, if you want to put together a sentence, you need to have two things in a sentence. Does anybody know what two things we need in a sentence? As a minimum, in the English language, we need two things in a sentence. Does anybody know what they are? Yes, you're absolutely right. You need a subject and you need a predicate. Let's call it a verb, just so that everybody can understand. So what's a subject? That is what or whom the sentence is all about. And what's a verb? This is a subject action or a state of being. A state of being means uh, this, this desk is brown. Uh, the desk isn't really doing any action, but we are describing the state of being. Uh, we use the word the verb to be, or sometimes we use the verb to have. Now, this is really important, and sometimes the GMAT will omit one of them. Uh, very cleverly, for example, the GMAT might say, uh, Sergey is studying for the GMAT, or the GMAT could say, Sergey studying for the GMAT. Well, all of a sudden, if we're saying studying for the GMAT, that word studying is actually no longer a verb. There are quite a number of different words in the English language that have been verbs, but they become something else. For example, in this case, it, this verb becomes a participle. Uh, sometimes it becomes a gerund. Sometimes it becomes an infinitive. So it plays a different role. It's no longer a verb. So you need to make sure that there is a subject and there certainly is a verb, and then you have what's called a clause. A clause could then become a standalone sentence. When you have a subject and a verb, you could have a proper sentence, but you need to make sure before you make that determination is that the subject and the verb agree. So that is the rule that's actually one of the most commonly tested rules in sentence correction, and that is a rule of agreement. So how do they agree? The agreement that is tested on the GMAT when it comes to the subject and the verb is the agreement in number. There are different other ways of agreement that we don't really need to worry about. But on the GMAT, it's going to be an agreement between the plural subjects and plural verbs or the singular subjects and the singular verbs. For example, I could say a bird sings, or I could also say birds sing. I need to make sure that both the subject and the verb are singular or both of them are plural. Now, when you are trying to apply this agreement rule, very often you need to find a subject and find a verb. The GMAT, of course, won't tell you, oh, that's a subject, oh, that's a verb. That's why it's important to pay attention to detail that studying is not a verb. And not every noun is actually a subject because we also, in sentences, have what we call objects. What's the difference between the subject and the object? Really simple. Subjects have verbs, objects don't. Now we'll talk about how to determine whether something's a subject or an object in a moment, but essentially anything that does not perform any action would be an object, and anything that does would be a subject. Because objects don't perform any action, they do not have any verbs, therefore this rule does not apply to objects. There is no way that we can apply a subject-verb agreement rule to an object because 
we don't have a subject, right? This is subject verb agreement rule. It's not just a noun verb agreement rule. Now, how do we actually determine when somebody, something is a subject versus an object? There's actually a very useful rule that's going to help us take care of 80% of these decisions. And that is a rule of what's called the preposition. Now, what is a preposition? Preposition is a short word that connects nouns. The prepositions precede objects, but they do not precede subjects. And let me give you an example. I am giving a glass of water to John. So John is actually going to be an object because there is a preposition to right in front of John. So I am, now this is a subject and a verb, I am, I am giving a glass of water. Now a glass of water doesn't actually have a preposition, but it would still be an object because it doesn't perform any action, right? So if I say, uh, I am, uh, I'm going to a store. Again, the store is an object. I'm placing this book in the cupboard. Again, in the cupboard, we know cupboard's an object automatically. Looking for these short prepositions because they connect nouns, there's going to be usually quite a few of them in a sentence. And looking for them is going to be super helpful because we can get rid of all of the nouns with prepositions in front of them they would not be useful for our subject verb agreement rule. Here are examples of uh, prepositions of, in, for, uh, about, uh, to, above, beyond, under, over, these are all prepositions. So everything after that is always an object. Now, this is a super useful rule, but we're not quite done with the agreement yet. There's another agreement rule that's actually related to that. And it has to do with pronouns. Now, what's a pronoun? Well, pronouns are short words that replace nouns. If you can just please maybe put things in the chat box, just give me some examples of pronouns. I want to make sure that you remember what, what are pronouns. And uh, yes, I, yeah, absolutely, I said she and he, and, uh, and they and it, yes, these are all pronouns. Now the pronouns replace nouns. When you're replacing something, you want to make sure you're replacing it with the same thing, right? For example, a couple of days ago, I was fixing a, a, um, a faucet in our bathroom. And when I'm replacing a part, I want to make sure that I'm replacing it with a part that's compatible with that faucet. The same thing with a pronoun. I'm replacing a noun with a pronoun. I want to make sure that the pronoun is compatible with the noun it's replacing. So how could it be not compatible? You might be wondering. Here are the two things that you need to look out for. Number one, when you are replacing a noun with a pronoun, the pronoun, number one, must refer clearly to the noun it's replacing. So you have to be very clear, oh, that's what I'm replacing. And secondly, it must agree with the noun it's replacing. And we already talked about the agreement. So that agreement here is also going to be an agreement that is going to be the agreement in number. You also, you need to make sure that there's an agreement in the subject and a verb, uh, the subject and object agreement, the subjective versus the objective, right? So it has to agree. I'm actually going to show you a couple of examples right now where you will see how it might not agree so that you know what to look out for the next time. The pronouns can absolutely replace the subjects or they can replace objects as well. I'm going to show this to you in a moment. And somebody asked whether uh, this is going to be available. The recording of this 
workshop is going to be available. So you can uh, watch it at any time. We are going to send you a link. And uh, you, could, uh, you could certainly scroll to any part of this workshop and rewatch it again. It is going to be available to you. So let me give you an example. Here's a sentence. If you could please tell me where's the pronoun and please tell me whether it has been used properly. And just please put it in the chat box. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, the, yes, the pronoun is she. And a few of you said that it is not used properly. You're absolutely right, because she could potentially refer to either Melissa or Elizabeth. Now, if we put on a logical hat, we might think, well, wait a second. Elizabeth is in the hospital. And Melissa is visiting Elizabeth. So Elizabeth might be feeling unwell, right? That's, that we kind of we can make an assumption like that. However, is it possible that Elizabeth is actually a doctor and Melissa is visiting Elizabeth in the hospital because Elizabeth works there? Yes, it's possible. And the lesson we can draw from this is that if you grammatically cannot determine what the pronoun refers to, if it's possible that it can refer to either, that means the pronoun has not been used properly. And the second even bigger lesson from this sentence is please, you may want to write this down. I will never make my own assumptions on the GMAT. This is very important. This one advice is going to save you so much time and frustration. Please don't ever make your own assumptions. Now, sometimes you have to find somebody else's assumptions in critical reasoning, but you don't ever want to make your own. Okay, perfect. I'm glad that we've done this. Let me show you another one. I love shopping at Walmart because they have good prices. What do you think? Where's the pronoun and has it been used properly? Okay, the pronoun is they and, okay, so some of you said it has not been used properly and why not? What's wrong with the use of pronoun they? Ah, okay. So you're saying, well, wait a second, Walmart is actually singular, but that's not how we speak. Uh, we normally, when we speak, we just say, ah, I'm going to go to Walmart because they have good prices. They have this sale right now. And I looked at their flyer, right? So we automatically assume things. We maybe refer to the Walmart stores or the Walmart people, but grammatically Walmart's one company. So Walmart has good prices because it has good prices, not they. So watch out for that. That's something that GMAT loves to test. Let me give you another example. Some of you were asking about the difference um, and I'm actually going to show you that difference that you were just asking about. And I'll explain to you what is that difference in a moment. Please tell me which one is right. This GMAT class is for you and I or you and me. Okay. One person said you and I, everybody else is not sure. All right, couple people, you and I, couple people, you and me. Well, how do we know? We often speak you and I, right? And you may have heard in many songs, uh, you and I, uh, many of the artists, that's how they sing. Uh, but you and I is not always right. And if you want to know what to use, just drop the you, just say I or me. This GMAT class is for I. Or the GMAT class is for me. Don't let the you distract you. The you is the same. So get rid of it. Look at the difference. In this specific case, the difference is actually, grammatically, is that I is a subject and me is an object. So the pronouns can absolutely replace objects and me replaces an object. I replaces a subject. Because we, are, we have a preposition for, you and I or you and me don't actually do anything. The GMAT class does something here in the sentence. Therefore, we do need to use an object, an objective pronoun. Therefore, it's me. Again, on the test day, you get no brownie points for knowing 
what is the subject, what is an object, nobody is actually ever going to ask you for that terminology. So in this case, just drop the U and then see what happens. You're gonna find something similar in the second example. Who, whom is this class for? What is the right version here? Is it who or is it whom? Okay, some of you are saying who, some of you are saying whom. Obviously only one of them is right. Most of us are saying who 100% of the time. Sometimes we say whom when we actually should have, been, should have said who. However, the difference between who and whom is again, the difference between a subject and an object. Who is a subject, whom's an object? And the answer to this question is they or them. They is a subject, them's an object. So answer this question. Who is this class for? It's for they. Is that true? It's for they. No, it's not. It's for them, right? So them is an object. Therefore, we need to say whom. And by the way, this is a very useful rule I personally use because we have that M at the end, right? So them, then I need to use whom. They, then I would say who. Who is teaching a class? They do. Who is this class for? For them. Is this helpful? We've actually just learned uh, the most important sentence correction rule. So now I'd like to put it to practice. What I'd like to do is give you a real GMAT question. I'll give you one minute and 30 seconds. This is how much you normally get for a sentence correction question. And I'm going to ask you, what's the answer? Here is the question. And I'm gonna stay quiet for 90 seconds. All right, as you could see, it has been 90 seconds. So I am going to now stop this poll. If you didn't choose an answer yet, I'm going to give you five more seconds. Please choose an answer. And I'm going to show you what everybody voted for. Okay, I am going to uh, share this with you in a moment, but I wanted to ask you, as you could see by the majority vote, the answer is C, and then we have B and D, an equal number of people to have chosen, and then E and then A. Does anybody want to share really quickly in a chat box, how did you choose an answer here? What kind of strategy, what were you looking for as you were choosing an answer? Okay, you're looking for parallelism, perfect. And, uh, and what did you choose then? If, if you were looking for parallelism, what was your answer? Okay, okay, great. It looks like E is the question where we have the parallelism. Some of you said 
actually, okay, yeah, some of you actually said C because it flows a little bit better. Uh, I maybe sound better. C also seems to have a par the parallel structure, right? the sleep and, and use, the sleep and move. Uh, so it looks like it's C or maybe it's E. Uh, some people chose some other answer choices. It certainly seems like a fairly difficult question because fewer than half of the people got this right. So let's take a look here. Now, let me ask you a question. As you were doing this question, I know you focused on the parallelism. This is actually not the rule that we've learned so far. And I've shown you this question. I know we're going to build gradually in uh, the different, uh, different strategies. The strategy that I have shown you already was the strategy of the agreement. So did anybody actually focus on the agreement? I'm just curious. I know some people said this and uh, yeah, and I know you, you, you also said it kind of sounded right. Uh, well, let's see. One of the things that I think is going to be quite important to understand is that if you look at the answer choices, half of the answer choices approximately, well, actually three out of five, use the plural swaths and two of them use single swaths. Now, swaths hang, and the swaths hanks. Unfortunately for us, both could potentially be right. Because if we focus on the subject verb agreement, all five answer choices in different versions follow the subject verb agreement. They either use both single or both plural. So how could we use that agreement rule? Well, remember I mentioned that there is the second agreement rule, and that's the agreement of a pronoun. And most of you have found it really easily in a shorter sentence, especially since I've actually asked you to look for a pronoun. I didn't really ask you to look for a pronoun here, and that's what the GMAT will often do as well. And because the pronouns are so short, remember that we also talked about the attention to detail? Attention to detail is really important in sentence correction. If there is a pronoun in the sentence, usually it's there for a reason. And guess what? There are two pronouns in this sentence. I don't know if you noticed that. There are it's, there are two pronouns, it's, it's code and it's toes. Now it's is a singular pronoun. Therefore, the first three answer choices are automatically gone because it could only refer to the swaths. It cannot refer to swaths. Now you might be wondering, well, wait a second. Uh, I don't have just one swath in uh, Central America. That's also something that the GMAT likes to do. The GMAT will refer to the species. I remember a question from one of the smaller supplemental guides on the GMAT that was, uh, using the words North American moose. Now, what's interesting is that, that North American, the North American moose could refer to one moose, many moose, because moose is also plural. It could also refer to the species of the moose. So it was super confusing, could be one or the other. And again, what helped us in that question is to look for that pronoun. All right, so now that we've got rid of the three, and I know many of you are thinking, well, now it's E. I know some of you actually put this in a chat box. Huh, it might be E because it flows better. It has a parallel structure. It says, hangs from trees by its flow and rubbery limbs, sleeps 15 hours a day, and moves infrequently enough. So we have three verbs that are all in exactly the same form. And that would have been right if indeed they were parallel. But unfortunately, they're not. Because when they're looking for a parallelism, what has to be parallel is not just one word, but the entire phrase. E says, hangs, sleeps, and it moves. So we are introducing that extra pronoun, it moves, which essentially says the first two were just verbs, but the second's actually a clause, a subject and a verb. It breaks the grammatical structure. For that reason, E is wrong. And 
for that reason, because we have nothing else left, D is right. Now, I know many of you may have rejected D right off the bat because you thought it's not parallel. This was Hanks, comma, sleeping and moving. Sleeping and moving should have been also hands and moves. That's also something that GMAT likes to do because actually sleeping and moving are not the part of that list. They create a separate list of describing the process of Henny. They're both participle, sleeping and moving, so they're not verbs anymore. They don't belong to the list with Hanks. They create their own list that actually is called a participle modifier that consists of two participles that describe the process of Henny. That's why it's correct. And again, why E is wrong? Because in E, the structure is not parallel. The verbs are parallel, but it's not just the verb. The whole grammatical structure of everything we're listing out has to be parallel. And we have hangs, sleeps, and it moves. So it does not belong to this grammatical structure. Therefore, it's wrong. That's why e is right. D is right. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And if you did get this wrong, and 80% uh, uh, or 79% of everybody who answered actually didn't get this right, then don't worry. Uh, you may have relied on how this sentence sounds. And that what that tells us is that we can't actually do this because we don't talk good. And actually, uh, most of us don't talk good. It's, it's not just us. Uh, and it's uh, the, the, the Walmart. If you go into the Walmart store, uh, we know already by now they have good prices, right? Uh, but also, even the signs in Walmart are not necessarily grammatically correct. If you look at this sign that I actually snapped at one of our local Walmart stores, it says express checkout 12 items or less. That is grammatically incorrect because we cannot say less items. Items is something we can count. So the word to use with items would be fewer, not less. So don't worry if you didn't get this right. We've learned an important lesson. And that is we need to be aware of the GMAT traps. And one of the biggest traps is to go by what sounds right. Please, when you're studying for the GMAT, do not choose what sounds right. Don't choose what looks right. Don't choose what feels right. You got to know the rules. Some grammatical rules, remember, there are not so many of them. But what's even more important, you need to learn the strategies. You have to have attention to detail. And notice how these pronouns really hurt us here in this question. So pay attention to pronouns. You already know that they're important. And master that process. That's going to come, of course, with a lot of practice. I'm going to come back to this, to this uh, overall framework of study, knowing the rules, learning the strategies, and mastering the process again when we summarize what we've done here today. But of course, just to wrap up sentence correction, I want to say, sounds easy, right? I wish the GMAT were this easy. I only wish. <sighs> what do you think about this sentence, by the way? I wrote this sentence. I don't know if it's right. Can you tell me whether it's right? And I know Sarah asked what, whether this question that we've just done is actually hard. Uh, it's not the easiest question, but it's certainly not the hardest question. It's probably a medium to a slightly over medium. Okay, not correct, right? Um, actually, uh, everybody who's answered so far said, yes, absolutely, I wish the GMAT was this easy because, uh, uh, because the GMAT, of course, is, is singular. We don't say the GMATs. We say the GMAT because the GMAT is a single test. So it should be, was this easy, right? Yes, thank you. Oh, actually, I'm impressed. Uh, now, actually two people, or actually three people now, after we talked about this, you probably just heard this by the tone of my voice, or maybe you knew the rule, which is even better, that the where here is actually right. Because this is called a subjunctive mood, 
don't really need to know the terminology, but we are dealing here, here with something that's actually not true. So we're using the specific form of a verb, and this form is actually a past tense, but in this specific example, we use where instead of was or to be. I also could say, I wish, um, I wish somebody were a little more attentive in this workshop, even though we're talking about the present tense. So we always use where. And you may have heard the phrase, I wish I were you. Same idea. That's why where here is actually right. Well, on this positive note, I'd like to move on now to talk about arguments. I actually want to ask you a question. Have you ever seen an argument? Have you ever seen people argue? You may have. And when people argue, very often there would be, yeah, exactly. On Facebook, people argue all the time. Uh, when people argue, they would usually argue about a certain point. And there are certain, certainly a very small number of questions on the GMAT they would deal uh, with two people arguing. It's a little more common on the LSAT. There's a question type that's called a point at issue. It's extremely, extremely, extremely rare on the GMAT. Most of the time, the argument involves the argument by just one person. I don't know if you ever tried arguing with yourself. Uh, sometimes I, I try that. I think it's a lot of fun to argue with yourself. But actually on the GMAT, all of the arguments, 99.9% .9 of the arguments are going to be argument by one person. So how can one person argue? We've already seen this at the beginning of our workshop. Essentially, it's by putting your thoughts in a certain logical structure. If I want to have an argument, I need to have two things in my argument. The thing number one, I gotta have a conclusion, also known as a claim. It's known by some other, terms such as the main point or the main idea of the argument, the idea is still the same. I am trying to communicate something important. Let me give you an example of an argument with a conclusion. I attended an awesome GMAT class today. I take my preparation seriously. I make the right decisions. Therefore, I will get a high score on the GMAT. That is my conclusion. I'll get a high score on the GMAT. Now, it's not enough for me to just simply say, I'll get a high score on the GMAT. Most of the time, people are going to ask you immediately, why? And the answer to that question would be your evidence, also known as a premise, also known as the reason or the support behind that idea or that point. In this specific argument, this evidence was the part that says, I take my preparation seriously and I make the right decisions. That is why I'm gonna get a high score. The fact that you attended the awesome GMAT class today may also be an evidence, or it could simply describe what we're talking about. It could be some background information. It might actually not contribute, or maybe will contribute to you making the right decision and getting a high score on the GMAT. So structuring your argument in this logical way is what the, really the critical reason is all about. You very often are going to be given arguments and very often or most of the time, you wouldn't just need to describe the argument. You very often would also need to do something with the argument. Now, describing an argument, uh, many people think it's a little easier than actually doing something with the argument. The first question we've done today is a question that's called a boldface type question. It's actually one of the types or subtypes of critical reasoning questions. It is the most common question type. 90% uh, of the questions that describe arguments are actually bold case questions. And many of them could be fairly challenging. But there's one thing to describe an argument and other things to actually do something with that information. Sometimes the GMAT will ask you to strengthen the argument or weaken the argument or maybe evaluate an argument in a certain specific way. Try to understand if that argument is valid or flawed. So that's what you will need to do most of the time. Or maybe derive certain conclusions from the argument. We actually talk in our class about 11 different subtypes of questions in critical reasoning. 
So I wanted to show you one of the questions. This is again a question from a past exam. So it's a question, the way that it appeared for some test takers some time ago, to be retired. So you won't actually see that question in the real test, but you will see questions that are very similar. So that's how we're going to practice. I'm going to give you exactly one minute and 48 seconds. Actually, you know what, I'll be generous. I'll give you two minutes. Uh, you get an average of minute and 48, but I'll give you two minutes so you could see it in that poll window. And at the end, we'll talk about that question. So here's the question, and I'm going to stay quiet for two minutes. We have 15 seconds left, so if you could please choose an answer, that would be great. And if you're not quite sure yet what the answer is, don't worry, just pick an answer anyway. The test cannot continue until we pick an answer. Okay, I'm going to end the poll right now. Thank you so much for answering. If you haven't chosen an answer yet, please choose an answer right now. And in a moment, we will find out what is the right answer based on your votes. Drum roll, please. The answer is B. Congratulations. So we have B and then we have C and E, again, equally distributed than A and D. So it looks like many of these answer choices look fairly appealing. Let's look at different ways of doing this question. I'm uh, going to share with you some of the ways that I have seen how people approach this question. And if you have done the question this way, then please feel free to share in the chat box uh, that uh, this is maybe the way that you've done. Again, you can share it just with me. Just choose to all chat to all panelists. Uh, this way, uh, nobody else is going to see. So here are some of the ways to do this question. Let's call the first way the sounds right way. That's how many people approach this question. What sounds right or looks right or feels right? What we're going to do is we'll read the passage. Uh, then we'll read the question, then we'll read the answer choices. That's the way that the information is presented in front of us. It was a little hard to understand at first what's going on. I'm just curious if anybody can share in the chat box, how many times have you read this uh, passage and maybe the uh, answer choices? And then, yes, thank you, thank you. So I know many of you are saying twice or three times. Yeah, that starts with a question. Okay, that's great. That's perfect. We'll get to this in a moment. Now, 
when if you're doing the question this way and uh, then you look at the answer choices or maybe you've read the question first then you look at the answer choices and then you're trying to find something that is going to be related to what we talked about now this is a question about earthquakes it's also about an island it's about a year so we're going to be looking for something that's related that sounds familiar a i don't know about that sounds a little weird uh, how about B? Uh, B? B is about Cyprus. It's about the earthquake. It's about something that occurred in 365. So certainly looks familiar. C looks weird. Coins, statues, inscriptions, they all look not related. Some people would say they look out of scope. Uh, so maybe then after that time, we either choose uh, B. Yeah, not, nothing else was this. You know, the other things weren't really mentioned. So what does it really have to do with the coins? We're talking about the earthquake. Uh, and then uh, maybe we can spend some time rereading what we've just uh, read in the question, maybe rereading some of the answer choices again, make sure we really don't understand them, what they're talking about, and then we'll pick B. And I know I've given you two minutes, but I have seen sometimes in my class, I would give uh, people, uh, our clients more than two minutes, sometimes four minutes. And you just what many people would do in four minutes, is just simply read again and, and again, choose B because we don't have a better way. So that is not going to be a good way. Let's learn some new strategies and let's learn some rules. Let's call the next way the rules way. And the rule is we want to read the question first. The reason why we want to do this, we want to understand what the question's asking before we actually approach the passage. And if you've done that, congratulations. You've understood that this is a strengthen question. We're trying to strengthen the argument. So we will read the passage, we'll identify where's my conclusion, where's my evidence. The conclusion here is that hypothesis that the destruction was due to this earthquake. We are then going to look for an answer choice that will strengthen that conclusion. Now, let's look at the answer choices now. Does A strengthen that conclusion? Not really. It does not actually seem very relevant. How about B? B gives us some information, some new information that would actually tell us, oh, wait a second. Many modern histories mention that, so it looks like it certainly strengthens our conclusion. That's exactly what we're looking for. C, again, seems irrelevant, doesn't really do anything, neither does D, neither does E. So we're going to pick B confidently. We can do this in two minutes. We had a system, we, had the, we were following the rules, and we've fallen into a trap. Unfortunately, B was not the right answer. I know some of you may be a little surprised. So let's immediately jump into the next way of doing this question. Let's call this the mastery way. So how could we do this question? We need to know some rules and that's important. And the rule is read the question first because you want to be efficient. You know, want to know what to look for. This is a strength in question. We will then read the passage. We will indeed identify the conclusion and evidence. This is really important. This is the rule. But then we need to understand what strategies could we use. And of course, then we need to practice these strategies to make sure we're very comfortable with them. Now, the way we're going to approach strengthening questions is we need to understand what exactly can we strengthen. And what we can strengthen in the question is an assumption that the author is making. So let's think about this just for a second. What the author has just told us is that there was this island, we did the excavations, and we've discovered a certain pattern of debris. This points to the fact that the town was destroyed by an earthquake. Uh, now, because we're not experts in archaeology, we can pretty much just accept this as base value, right? That was an evidence that was presented to us. So the town was destroyed by an earthquake. At least we have a reason to believe so. Is there anything else that we know here? If anybody can share, is there anything else that we know in this argument? Uh, 
yeah, the excavation, yeah, that's absolutely true. We do have an excavation. However, there is something else that we know. And something else is actually fairly easy to miss. But that something else is that we were told that there was an earthquake near the island in AD 365. So we know there was an earthquake. We know the town was destroyed by an earthquake, and we're assuming that the town was destroyed by that earthquake. However, we're actually overlooking a possibility. We're overlooking that the town could have been destroyed by some other earthquake. We were actually never told that there wasn't any other earthquake that could have destroyed the town. We just know there was one earthquake. So we are assuming, we're making an assumption is that this earthquake destroyed the town. So when we're looking to support this argument, well, when we're looking to strengthen this argument, we are going to be looking for something that provides us additional piece of evidence that tells us that it was this earthquake that destroyed the town, not some other earthquake. I hope it makes sense. If it certainly doesn't, then you can put this in the chat box. So now we're going to look for an answer choice that will help us understand, was it that earthquake or was it some other earthquake? Let's take a look. A doesn't really do anything, doesn't tell us whether it was that earthquake. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Some of you are already picking it up. B was a clever, clever, clever trap by the GMAT. B gave us something we already know. We were told that there was an earthquake in 8365. So B supports the argument by supporting the, the evidence. We do not want to support the evidence. We want to support the assumption and that's how we can support the conclusion. We want to support something we don't know. Why do we want to support something we know already? So that's a clever trap. How about C? C tells us we couldn't find any coins after 8365 but we found a lot of coins before that. So what does this evidence point to? Well, it points to the fact that after 8365, the town was no longer. There was no economy, probably no people. Given this evidence and the fact that the town was likely destroyed by an earthquake and there was actually a pretty big earthquake that year, we can safely say that now our argument is a little stronger. It's a little more believable. So that hypothesis, now we have a stronger reason to believe that hypothesis. Now, here's an interesting part. The fact that we believe this argument a little stronger, a little better, also tells us that we don't actually know this for sure. There isn't 100% proof that the town was destroyed by the earthquake. But in strengths and questions, we don't need that. We just need to understand if the argument is a little stronger than it was before. And what's even more interesting is that only one answer will do that. Because if more than one would, then there would be two right answers on the GMAT, and that is not possible. Because we found an answer choice that makes our argument stronger, we can actually now stop and move on. We've already found our answer. We don't even have to read D and E. They cannot be right. We found the right answer. We spent less than a minute and we got this right. I hope you enjoyed it. The lesson learned, the lesson that we can take away is that we need to know the strategies of how to deal with questions. In that specific question, it was look for an assumption. Notice, you remember I mentioned about an hour ago, do not ever make your own assumptions. We didn't. We found an assumption that was made by the archaeologists. We found it, and then we found evidence that actually makes that assumption stronger. All right, now, how hard do you think is this question? Okay, it, it, yeah, it's kind of hard. It's not the hardest question, but it is kind of hard. It's a tricky question. B is certainly the most popular answer. 
Uh, but it's not a super hard question. Uh, if you know what you're doing, it will be easier. And you can do this question in under a minute. And that probably is a question that's in the high 600. So I would say maybe only about 20%, 15 to 20% of people get that question right. But now that you know what to look for, and now that you know also what to look for in traps, you wouldn't get into this trap anymore. So you're not gonna try to strengthen something you already know. Somebody asked, what if E strengthens the argument even more? Well, remember we said there's only one right answer. So that is not possible. There couldn't be something that strengthens it more. There's one that strengthens it and four that don't. They can do something else. They could weaken it. They don't have to, but they wouldn't strengthen it. Now, I do want to share with you a couple of more tips about how to study for the GMAT, but before that, I want to spend maybe about three or four minutes talking about the reading comprehension. Uh, let me ask you a question before we do that. Do you get super excited about reading comprehension? Who gets super excited about reading comprehension? Every time you see reading comprehension, you're like, yes. One person. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, reading comprehension certainly could be really boring. And we get really frustrated with reading comprehension because we focus on trying to understand the content because that's how we used to reading. The content is going to be boring, is going to be very often not interesting. However, the content is actually not that important. Because remember, the GMAT can give you any sort of a content. The GMAT isn't expecting you to understand what the person is saying. What the GMAT is expecting you to understand is how the author is making a point. So how the structure is so much more important than the what. You have seen this in critical reasoning. This is certainly also very important in reading comprehension. If you don't know anything about that subject matter, that's, oh, that's okay, that's actually good because everything that you need to know is right in front of you. So don't focus on trying to understand deeply the content, focus on understanding the structure, the relationship between the different parts of the paragraph. That's what's going to help you. And that will involve actually teaching yourself how to read differently or getting somebody to teach you. Actually, if you come to our class, we spend about two hours in our reading comprehension class just focusing on how to read and how to take notes. Because it's really important. So how are you going to read? Every time you read, you are not going to just read blindly or uh, you're not going to just zone out. You are going to read with a certain purpose. And your purpose is going to be as follows. First of all, you're going to pay attention to how is the passage organized. And the easiest way to keep track of that is to ask yourself a question. What was the purpose of each of the paragraphs that I have just read? You may want to write this down. Use shorthand, try to be quick, but try to make sure you can read your writing. You also want to ask yourself, what was this passage about? And the easiest way to answer that question is to ask yourself, what would be a good title for that passage? How would I? actually call that passage. You also want to understand how does the author relate to that topic by asking yourself a question, what was the tone or emotion? Try to pick up these emotional keywords. Is the author completely neutral? So the author is using a very dry language. Is the author trying to be excited or a little excited or very excited? Is the author trying to criticize something? Is the author very clearly biased towards one of the opinion and against another opinion? This is really going to help on questions that actually ask you about the author's attitude and also questions that ask you to agree or disagree with an author. They're called inference questions. They're actually one of the most common reading comprehension. And then finally, ask yourself this question. What's the primary purpose of the entire passage? This isn't really the title, but it's certainly related to the title. But try to answer this question. Why did the author write this passage? What was the reason? And I can guarantee you 
the reason was not to make your life miserable on the GMAT. None of these passages were written for the GMAT. All of them were written for some sort of a scientific journal or some, some sort of a popular journal, usually scientific journals. And that means that all of these passages actually talk about some real subject matter. So if you need a reason to get excited about reading comprehension, that's a way for you to learn about, let's say, astronomy or geology. What could be more exciting, right? But that's how you can begin training yourself. And you can start right now. We are certainly, if you come to our class, we're going to go much deeper into the step-by-step -step process. We'll talk about what to look for, how to take note, what keywords to look for. But the overall structure, the overall framework you have right in front of you. And again, we are going to be sharing this recording with you so you can always refer back to these questions. Sounds pretty easy, right? All I have to do is learn these things. Then what is actually missing for most of the people? I know we talked about this, that when many people are putting together st their study plans, uh, they, they get a lot of books, they get a lot of knowledge, but yet still many people struggle. And uh, you've seen the statistics of everybody who decides to study for the GMAT. Let's say if we take 100 people who decide to study for the GMAT, only 10 will actually do the test. And of these 10, only one will get a score of 700 or more. So if you get a score of 700, you're actually not in the top 10%. You're in top 1% because 90% of people gave up before they even showed up for the test. So what's missing? We see this again and again and again. And when people really discover this, then they realize they can get much better results much quicker. The thing that's missing, number one, is a structure. There has to be certain things you are going to be doing week by week to start moving the needle on the GMAT. There's so many resources, there's so many different tips and tricks, but if you try to put them all together in your head all at once, things could be really, really overwhelming. One of the things we hear a lot from our clients who come to study with us is that at the very beginning of their class, they would say, oh, I'm so relieved that right now I have this structure. I don't have to worry about me getting a score of 760 on the GMAT. All I need to do is take this step over the next week. And then the following week, I'm gonna do this. And then the following week, I gotta do this. So the structure is really important. The way you learn, the way you do, the things you focus on, it's really important that you also build on the things that you're doing each week. So that's the first thing. The second thing that's really important is accountability. You have to be accountable if you want to get good results to yourself or to others. That's why in our class, we would very often have challenges for our students to keep them more accountable. Some of them like a bigger push. Some of them like a slightly smaller push. Sometimes they would work with somebody else in class to keep them accountable. But it's also really important because the GMAT could sometimes be hard, especially if you're getting a lot of questions right at first. So you need to be accountable. You need to see the light at the end of the tunnel. That's why, for example, our class is six weeks long. So by the end of the six weeks, you have that momentum. You've been doing this for over a month, and now you can just keep going. So it's really, really important to have that culture of accountability. And finally, what's missing for a lot of people, and this is one of the, one of the things that actually misses, is missing in many GMAT classes as well, is the, is the focus on the skills. It's really important that when you are studying for the GMAT, when you are preparing, you don't just focus on, let's say, learning a formula or reading a rule, but you actually focus on developing the skill. And the analogy I like to use very often is a game of golf. I can tell you that I know how to play golf. I watched many hours of Tiger Woods playing. I've read a few books on golf, but I never held a club in my hand. So would you say I know how to play golf? Hmm, it's a tricky question. I know how to play golf, but can I play golf? Probably not. So knowing how and actually playing it are different things. And of course, the first time you play, things might not necessarily go well right up front. So you need to overcome that frustration, perhaps get some coaching. Uh, Tiger Woods has, has a coach. All of the athletes have coaches. 
so get a coach. It's uh, really important because it's sometimes hard to understand what is my own mistake. Now the structure accountability and the focus on the skills, if you have all these three ingredients, you are bound to get a score of 700 as long as you are committed. And of course, the culture of accountability is going to keep you committed. So where can you get all of this? Well, you can get all of this in one place. I'm going to share with you just a quick quote from one of our clients. She's actually in our class right now. She's almost finished in the class. Now she's actually came to one of these seminars about a month and a half ago or uh, almost two months. And then we connected uh, the next day. She actually uh, signed up for a one-on-one -on -one consultation. I gave her a call. And then this is what she wrote after being in class for about two weeks. She actually sent me an email and that's exactly what she said. That's a word for word copied from the email. She said, I spent a lot of money and time working with a one-on-one -on -one tutor for over a year. And in all the prep courses, she's taking many different courses, not just necessarily on the GMAT, but other courses that she's been preparing for other exams as well. She's never seen a program focused on the skills need to acquire 700 plus score, which was actually interesting because she, uh, she, she, she found us uh, through a grapevine and then she realized that, look, I've actually never seen this before. I've never seen this focus on the skills. Uh, and then she's also added that she, she liked the structure, the, the way that even the, the book is organized, the workshops that we are adding as well. So outside of the class, uh, I'll talk about this if we have time. Every Thursday, we have the skills building workshops uh, with a guest speaker who talks about a lot of really cool skills. Uh, we, we talked about time management. We talked about, uh, we're gonna be talking about networking skills, about the nonverbal communication, lots of really, really interesting things, right? She's actually told me that in two or three weeks in the class, she's seen better results than she's seen in a year working one-on-one -on -one with a tutor. Uh, and I just uh, was really found it fascinating how somebody who really now begins focusing on the skills can see much better results much quicker. So I'd like to invite you, if that is what you're looking for, if you're really committed to this journey, I'd like to invite you to come and join us. Uh, we have a program that's called GMAT Mastery. And this is really a skills-based training that includes all of these things, it includes a very, very structured approach. So every week you would know this is only as much as I need to do this week. I'm not gonna worry about what I do next. Right now, I'm just going to focus on this. So the GMAT becomes manageable. You see the end in sight. And you also know that you're going to acquire a lot of very useful skills. So how things are working right now, during this lockdown, we offer virtual classes. It's just like a real class. I was actually talking with this client yesterday and she, she told me these are not really online classes. They don't really look online. They are really virtual classes, but they look like in-person classes. There's going to be lots of support. Uh, we know sometimes life gets in the way, so we'll get you re let you repeat the class for free for one year. There'll be a, lots and lots of support. Uh, you can come and do some tutoring sessions. We offer twice a week tutoring sessions. You can come in for free. And the programs that we are going to be offering uh, in the month of June, we've just started the class two days ago, but in the month of June, these are two classes. There's one on weekends. There is going to be an afternoon class, Eastern time. So if you're located in the Northern hemisphere, this likely would work for you really well. Uh, some, we have uh, clients in, in Asia and Europe. It might not work as well. So you might uh, want to wait for the next morning class in July, or if you are committed to stay a little bit later in the evening, you can do that as well. Uh, there's also a class on evenings, and that's a six to 10 class on Tuesday and Thursday nights. Uh, we have a special offer of uh, $200 off for this class, for actually both of these classes. For the first three people who join these two classes, you are going to be able to save $200. And all you need to do is uh, go to that website called admitmaster.com slash offer. You're going to find the link to this class you will be able to sign up and we will know the first three registrations that come in. By the way, you don't need to make any payments when you submit the registration, we will get in touch with you. And then after the, the consultation, we will actually get you your spot reserved. 
and we just ask for a $500 deposit to reserve your seat. And now we do have a guarantee, and our guarantee is we will continue working with you until you are done. I know many of you are super committed. You came to this class this evening. So we want to make sure you get this result. That's why we will continue working with you. If it takes three months or six months or a year, it does not really matter. You're going to find these special offers on that website. Again, as I mentioned, we're also going to send them to you uh, tomorrow. So whether you want to take our live training or you uh, can't really commit to that time and you want to study yourself, uh, or you've already been studying quite a bit and you just need to have access to some practice problems, uh, there, there is uh, one of the offerings that you're going to find on this page. Uh, you can check it out and find that special offer as well. Uh, these special offers are actually going to expire. It says April 30th, so uh, it's actually going to expire on May 31st, that special offer. So what can you expect? When you come to our classes, we do keep track of the success rates of our clients and the average scores. Uh, yeah, I will absolutely send you information about the special offers. You are going to get this tomorrow morning, first thing tomorrow morning. So please make sure that you see that email and you open it up. I'm going to mention all of that in the email tomorrow morning. The average score of our clients is 670 and approximately one in three of our clients, actually 35%, so it's a little more than one in three, achieve scores of 700. And again, that structure, that culture of accountability and that focus on the skills versus knowledge is going to be really important. So we'll show you, if you haven't been to our master pressure class, we'll show you a lot of different ways of approaching the math questions as well. You also realize that the verbal questions are as black as white and white as math questions. Uh, so that's uh, also something that we'll talk about in two weeks if you haven't been to our master pressure class. Now, I know many of you are also wondering, oh, so this is great. I, I now know how I can achieve a score of 700. And I know, now know what I need to get that score. Is there anything else that I need to get into a good school? And that is why we have a very special guest Teresa Perez from the Smith School of Business. So it's uh, one of the top ranked schools here in Canada, who's going to share with you some of the valuable tips on how to get in. And before we bring in Teresa, she's going to actually present her own uh, few slides. I would just like to leave you with an invitation. If you are committed, if you are serious to get serious results on the GMAT, I'd like to invite you to join us. First of all, as I have mentioned, we have special skills building workshops. We'd love to see you at these workshops. They are every Thursday, twice a day. And this workshop this Thursday is going to be about the effective use of body language and nonverbal communication. As you're preparing for your interview, your body language is going to be really important. So check that out. Our next Master Pressure class is on Tuesday, June 9th. Also, if you haven't done a diagnostic test, I'd like to invite you to take this test. You can go to smith.trygmod.com. So we have this, um, this exam in partnerships with the Smith School of Business. It, it's uh, our software that uh, you could use. And at the end of the test, which takes about three hours, you're going to know exactly not only what your score is, but also what you need to improve. If you'd like to join our virtual live classes that are taught by one of our best instructors, he's really amazing, really hilarious, uh, and he's going to keep you on your toes for the entire four hours. These are the next two classes. There is a weekend class and the evening class. Both of them are going to start in June and end in July. And you'll find all of that on our website, adminmaster.com offer, and we'll send you an email tomorrow morning with all of these resources. We'd like to thank you again for participating and for taking a part in all of the questions that we've done so far. I am going to stick around. However, I will put myself on mute for the next 15, 20 minutes. Uh, Teresa is going to share a few tips with you. And then at the end, both I and Teresa are going to answer your questions. So if you have any questions, just please put them in the Q&A box. And I am now going to unshare my screen so that Teresa can begin sharing hers. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. We can. Great. Thanks so Wonderful. much for joining us, Teresa. No, thank you. I just um just need to be made a host so I can share my screen. Yeah, there we go. I, Wonderful. I just, I just did.
Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Sergey and, and Mintmaster. Uh, we have had a longstanding uh, uh, informal partnership, um, which we are, we feel has been uh, very fruitful, um, both for you and for us. We've gotten some great candidates year over year from Mintmaster that have scored great on the GMAT. So I hope you've all taken in what Sergey has said and that you join those courses because uh, they will make a big difference in how you score and give you those fundamental skills to be successful on writing the GMAT. Before I begin, I will let everyone know that if you do start an application by the end of June, so June 30th, if you start an application and you're and you go through the preliminary assessment, you will be put into a draw to win a free fee GMAT waiver. So that gives you plenty of time, uh, just over a month's time to get your application started. By no means do you have to complete an application. We're looking for you to start an application, have a conversation with us, get that preliminary assessment done, and then uh, prepare, prepare yourself as you're doing uh, today for that writing that GMAT. So I'm here to talk about the full-time MBA program at the Smith School of Business. I'm not going to take too much of your time. I know you're really trying to get an understanding of the GMAT and how you can best prepare, but this is a really great opportunity for you to get some tips from me as an admissions director and hopefully answer many of your questions as to how you can best present your profile. So my name is Teresa Perez and I'm the Associate Director of Recruitment and Admissions. I'm typically based out of the Smith Toronto facility, which is downtown Toronto. However, our program is in Kingston. It is a residential 12 month program that begins in January each year. Uh, typically, um, we have students in class Monday to Friday, 8.30 to 4.30 uh, between January and June. As we're all facing uh, this uh, COVID situation, this pandemic has um, unfortunately meant that we've moved to a virtual platform. However, our students are still getting all of the resources and are still getting the support that they need to be successful in the program. We are hoping that by January, things will be back to somewhat of normal, um, whatever normal means. And I can talk a little bit about what that will look like uh, in just a few moments. I've jotted down my email here as well as my LinkedIn. Take a snapshot of this. Please feel free to join uh, me on LinkedIn and send me an email if you have any questions. So today's uh, uh, short presentation will just take you through a short agenda here about our class profile. I'm going to provide some application tips, information on scholarship, and of course your qualifications for application, and then help answer any and all of your questions that you might have. Uh, first and foremost, many people are thinking, you know, what is the ideal candidate? What does the ideal MBA look like? And how do we, as a top business school, assess you? So these are four buckets that I, I like to walk candidates through, just so you have a clearer picture of what we fundamentally look for. There's lots of other things that you can present that I may not talk about in these four buckets, but that may make you stand out as an applicant. So we can talk a little bit about what that looks like, but for the uh, preliminary assessment for the um, start of applying to an MBA program, you're going to be sort of put into these four different areas and assessed equally against all of these measures against all of the applicants that are applying. So this is how we ensure uniformity and consistency in how we recruit candidates and to ensure our quality year over year in the cohorts. So intellectual horsepower really does sum up the GPA, what you did in your undergrad, and in combination with the standardized test like the GMAT. So we are, of course, looking for a score that is going to reflect your ability today, where a, a GPA reflected your abilities maybe four or five years ago, depending on how long it's been since you've done your GMAT. So we understand that there is a big difference um, in a test like a GMAT versus what you did over a four-year period, but we do like to see ultimately how you strategically and critically think, um, which can be seen through the GMAT test. And then we also want to see what you've done in the past and where your skill sets lie. And, and maybe where your education took you. And that's uh, where we move into the work ethic and resiliency piece, which is your resume, essentially. So we do look at your resume. We want to see accomplishments, okay? So in your resume, you want to make sure that you're adding things that you've been a part of. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've led or managed uh, projects or, or people, but we want to see that you have that aptitude for leadership. And if you have strong leadership in both uh, your, it could be personal and or professional, um, careers over the last you know four or five years and absolutely include that in your resume but these should be kept relevant okay so things that you did maybe in your undergrad uh, maybe if you were part of a club and that was over five years ago 
you might not want to include that. You want to be more relevant as to what your passions and your interests are today, and then help align those with how you're getting value from a leadership perspective. And this is ultimately what we want to see in your resume. And of course, in the cover letter. So the cover letter should really outline why you want an MBA, your motivation for an MBA, um, and then uh, tell us a little bit about what your post MBA goals are. So this is just in preparation uh, for how you can prepare your, your, the first piece of documentation that we will require, which is uh, the resume and then the cover letter. So only written pieces that we ask for is your resume and your cover letter. We do not ask for any uh, written essays. We do get that sample from the GMAT. Third bucket is gonna be your interpersonal skills. And we can see this through your Cura video. So it's a platform that we use to assess how you uh, think on the spot. Um, this is going to be behavioral type of questions. So this is not gonna be any skill types of questions that you're gonna get, but you do get the URL once you have started the application process. So after the preliminary assessment, you will be uh, working with an application advisor who will then walk you through these steps of applying to the program. So the interview really is the best place for us to see how you interact with us. Um, obviously during this time, we aren't having in-person interviews and we are doing everything at this stage virtually. And last is going to be your team experience and your coachability. So this can be seen in, in two ways. If you uh, work in teams at work, then we wanna see that through your resume and we ask you that in the interview, we ask you about your team experiences, we ask you to provide some solid examples of how you've been part of a team. So make sure you think about those. Um, and then of course, through what your references are saying. And we do ask questions specific to your references in regards to being coached uh, and what that uh, has been like in your career and in the references that you're choosing, which should always be um, your most current supervisor and or uh, a supervisor or superior in the last four or five years. Mentors also act as great references and we can talk about that a little later on. All right, so this is the current class profile. You can see here that the academic profile is very diverse, okay? So we're not looking for one type of academic profile when you're applying to our MBA program. Keep in mind, our MBA is a general management MBA with the ability to specialize in the last six months. All of the details around the curriculum and what we offer is all listed on, on our website. I don't, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but I'm happy to answer any uh, specific questions if you have them. You can see here, uh, we're 91 students this year. Um, this is uh, in part because we have 10 uh, returning graduate diploma in business students. So if uh, anyone's listening in, uh, thinking about a GMAT in the next year or so, uh, maybe doesn't have any work experience, we do have a program called the Graduate Business in Diploma, wherein that program will be the first um, 10 courses of the MBA, and then you have up to 10 years to come back and complete the MBA at a later stage. So we do have 10 returning GDBs. So the uh, cohort of the full-time MBA is really 80 students this year. So 80 students is generally around where we sit year over year for the full-time cohort. 28 is the average age, so it ranges from you know, 23 uh, right up to anywhere between you know, 32, 33. Four and a half years of work experience is the average years of work experience. And again, the range, there's always going to be these ranges uh, when you're looking at demographics, is between two years up to about eight years. If you're beyond the eight year mark, then you want to consider an executive MBA program. The average GMAT score for our program is 654. So this is great that you're here today to learn some tips uh, and to get some um, great uh, skills from Sergey. And hopefully you join one of the courses to, to ensure that you get in and around that average of 670. And one last thing that I'd like to note and highlight here is that we do have 44% women this year, which is the highest we have ever seen in our MBA program. And we're very proud of that. And this is attributed to uh, some of the partnerships that we have with Forte Foundation, as well as all of the events and activities that we um, have every year under Women of Influence and our Women in Leadership Club. Again, more details on our website about that. So some quick tips. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, what we look for. So here are just some quick tips that you can take away, uh, think about, um, come back to me if you have any questions or if you want to jump right into a preliminary assessment, then your application advisor will actually walk you through the entire process and give you some uh, tips and guidance on how to provide the strongest profile possible. But let's walk through a few of these right now. 
So tip one is reach out early. So you're already going through the right steps in getting your, your GMAT sorted and, and planning for that. That is one of the most important steps in applying to a top business school. So you wanna reach out to us as well early. So reaching out to admissions directors and the schools that you're looking to apply to, just to get a sense of the culture of the institution, to get a sense of what we look for and how you can best prepare your application. So it's always important that you have that preliminary conversation even before you start an application. That's what I'm here for and that's what my team is here to do is help answer your questions and make you feel comfortable and confident that this is going to be the right fit for you. Tip two is taking advantage of a preliminary assessment. So first and foremost, we do not have a fee to apply. It is free to apply to the Smith MBA program and there is no obligation for a preliminary assessment. So I always say to candidates, what do you have to lose? Why don't you just take a preliminary assessment See how it goes and at any point in time, if this is not going to be the right fit for you, then you can just close out your application. Nine times out of 10 applicants move forward and actually complete an application within three to four weeks. The preliminary assessment is going to require two things initially, resume in any format and unofficial transcripts. We actually give you a template so once you start an, a preliminary assessment, if there's anything on your resume that maybe we have questions about or we'd like you to work on, then we might just provide you with a template just to make it easier uh, for the admissions directors uh, to review. So don't worry about the format in which your resume is in. We will walk you through all of that. Three, find your fit. So again, going back to that first comment about reaching to, out to us early, it's also important to reach out to our current students. There's lots going on uh, in the program, in any MBA program. It's a very fast paced environment, especially in a one year MBA. And so our students are always up to really fun and interesting things, although they're always willing to have that conversation with our prospective applicants. There is a a link on our website called ambassadors it's actually under the student um, learn more about our students tab and you can actually click on any one of those profiles and ask your questions direct to one of our current students and i think given this climate and what we're going through right now it's important to understand that and to see what they're going through and how their um, how their program is going so i really recommend that you do that um, at any point in time to, to learn a little bit more about uh, what the program offers, the student experience, the student culture, and then learn a little bit more about what the students are, are up to um, given this uh, pandemic situation that we're all facing. Tip four is take the GVAT or GRE seriously. And this is you know, a big one, especially uh, where we are today, listening to Sergey and, and participating in this a workshop. It's really important that you prepare diligently for the GMAT. Um, and I'm sure this has been echoed throughout the slide deck today, the presentation today. Ultimately, we want to ensure that you are taking at least you know, two to three months to, to prepare and to really focus on getting the best score that you can get. We don't um, look at you know, multiple scores as a downside, but ideally you wanna write this one time. So this is where a, a course like Admitmaster offers is really a great opportunity to take advantage of because it's going to teach you um, strategic tips on how to beat the GMAT. Anyone can take the GMAT. Anyone can score well on the GMAT. It does not matter what background you come from academically or what you've done in your career. It really is about um, strategizing and learning those skills and those tips early on so that you can really do the best that you can in the GMAT. So take it when you're most prepared, but take it seriously. Um, a GMAT is going to be factored into how we assess you for acceptance and of course for scholarship. So we'll talk about that in a moment when I get to scholarships, but it is something that we look at in combination with the GPA. So this is a great way to increase your quantitative abilities if you, uh, for, for example, didn't do great in your, in your undergrad, or if you have a blip on your transcript, the GMAT can really help outweigh that. And last tip I wanna leave you with is apply when you're most prepared. Um, don't rush the process. We don't have deadline dates with the Smith MBA program. We are actually on a rolling admission basis. So this is again where you can start a conversation with us, get to know the culture of the school, speak to some current students, all while also preparing for the GMAT, okay? So uh, this is a really great opportunity right now since most people are working from home and they have more time to spend on themselves. This is personal development, but also a, 
a big professional development as for most of our students, they make some pretty um, amazing transitions uh, going from, you know, a musician to uh, investment banker or, you know, working in healthcare as a practitioner to now management consultant. So lots of uh, different ways in which you can advance your career and really be successful after a top MBA program like ours. So apply when you're most prepared. And what I mean by that is take the time to get to know us, to get to know what we look for and to put the best application forward that you can. Again, I'll just reiterate, we do not have deadline dates. We are on rolling admissions. What that means is that we will look at your application when it is complete. However, you do not need to have a GMAT before you start an application, okay? You can start the conversation and then work towards getting that application complete over the next three to four months. So the fees are listed here. 83,000 is the domestic fee and 99,500 is the international fee. All of our cases, textbooks, and materials are all included in the cost of tuition. And again, I will say there is no application fee. All of your coaching services and the resources that uh, accompany being successful in the program and securing a job are all included in the cost of tuition. There is no separate fees for ensuring your success from that standpoint. Your career coaches and all of the executive coaches that you're offered are all included in the cost of this tuition fee. Our scholarships are all merit-based, so we actually quantify everything that you give us. We put a score to uh, your interview and to your quantitative abilities, both in GPA and GMAT. Uh, we also score uh, your, your resume, your work experience, your accomplishments. Um, so there's different uh, touch points in which we will actually assess and quantify, and then we put those numbers into our rubric. The higher the numbers, the higher the GMAT. It's really straightforward. So that's not to say that if you have a lower score in one area that you can't qualify for scholarship, we do equally weight everything. So you still, most people actually do uh, secure some form of scholarship. 70% of our students get up to 60 to 70% total aid per student. Um, so that is a significant amount. And the range is 10,000 up to $60,000. And both international and domestic students are assessed equally. We do have some great opportunities for females only, so Forte Fellowships, and they range from $10,000 to $40,000. Ultimately, what we're looking for here, again, on merit basis, but really looking for that leadership. Um, you know, we want to see women that are going to take that next step, not only in their career, but also in what they can give back to an MBA class and help to retain women in the MBA program, but then make a difference in those coming after them. So really uh, impactful in terms of the events that they host and getting involved in the women in leadership. Um, those are the types of things we want to hear in the interview and what we want to see on your profile and uh, would warrant a, fo a Forte Fellowship. RBC is our preferred lender and they will loan up to the entire cost of the tuition. And then for international students, we partner with both Prodigy and Empower. So how you can join our next class? Quickly, I'll just I'll walk you through this, but ultimately all of this information again can be found right on our website. And I will just echo that we do provide the preliminary assessments. We have two great application advisors, Megan and Connor. If you are not already uh, started an application with the Smith School of Business, these are two great advisors who have been in this for quite a long time and would really be able to provide some really strong tips and guidance on how to be successful in the application process. So cover letter and resume are the only two written pieces. Okay, so keep that in mind. We actually ask for video essays and one short written response um, in, um, in replacement of any written essays. We look for about a B average in your academic background. So we look at the last two years of a four-year undergraduate degree. And in, on a case-by-case, -case, we will also review a three-year degree. Work experience, again, I mentioned this earlier, two years is the minimum. The range is anywhere from two to eight years. Two professional references. So we want to choose people that you know well. You want to choose people that can speak to your skills and abilities, your team experiences, your leadership or management. Uh, these are really the, the concrete examples that we want to try and get out of people that know you well. So titles don't impress us. <laughs> we really want to see that you're selecting people that know you and that can speak to your abilities, your most recent uh, abilities in your professional career. GMAT, again, we mentioned this earlier, 600 is the minimum. The average is, uh, you know, 654, um, but don't self-select yourself out. Uh, we do absolutely, you look at scores that are sometimes slightly lower than 600, but all other pieces of your application should really be quite solid um, if you are going to apply to us with a below 600 GMAT. And we talked about the Kira videos. Just to reiterate, this is a great way to see how you um, concisely uh, and quickly respond to behavioral types of questions. These are all going to be questions that 
you know, we're going to tell us a little bit about you, your personality, and uh, ultimately see how you, uh, how you function under a little bit of pressure. And then, of course, you're invited to interview, so keep that in mind. Not everyone is guaranteed an interview, so we do want to see, um, you know, your application complete before we move you forward to the interview. So quick facts, just to uh, keep this at the, the top of your mind and keep it fresh in your mind as you walk away from today's session. Uh, we are a 12-month MBA. We begin in January each year. 80 students per year, 44% uh, female. So we really do target strong females and we want to see uh, those females applying to our program to maintain this and, and hopefully see parity in the next couple of years. Uh, you are required to have a GMAT. So at this stage, we are not waiving any standardized tests. We are moving forward with requiring the GMAT or the GRE. Uh, there is the online testing uh, now that's available to candidates. Um, so if you are waiting or holding off until GMAT uh, uh, facilities open, that's perfectly fine. You can start an application at any point in time, but we won't be able to make an official decision on your file until we see uh, a completed GMAT. 95% employment. So we have the highest numbers in Canada, um, which we are very proud of. And, and this can really be attributed to our amazing career advancement team that works with each and every one of our students. You're actually assigned a career coach based on the function that you want to move into. So really great resources around ensuring your success in a program like ours. And you can see that, of course, in our 95% employment three months after graduation, but also in the average salary package post MBA. All-inclusive tuition, okay, we mentioned this earlier. It's uh, all-inclusive meaning cases, textbooks, materials, all of your coaching services um, are uh, included in that cost of tuition. Rated number one uh, in Financial Times for value for money. And we are in a small location. So we are in Kingston, Ontario, uh, which is in between Toronto and Montreal. For those of you listening in that are international, it's really centrally located to get to any of the major cities in Ontario. And keep in mind, there is no deadline dates. We are on rolling admission. So no obligation, no fee. It is free to apply. So what do you have to lose? Go ahead and start your application today. If you have any questions, again, I've listed my email here. So hopefully you've jotted that down. And I look forward to hearing from all of you shortly. I've also included some links here um, regarding uh, our social media platforms, wherein you can listen um, in on some great upcoming webinars that we have, as well as go back uh, to some of the material that we have on our Facebook group to see what we've been up to and what our students are doing. And of course, LinkedIn always has some fresh new material posted on a daily basis. So lastly, I'm going to close out with some frequently asked questions specific to scholarships and uh, presenting a strong profile and, of course, how COVID has impacted the program. So I know most of you um, are, you know, thinking, do I do this now? Do I wait? Um, obviously, if you're preparing for the GMAT, you know that it is good for five years. So, you know, there's no risk in preparing for that, especially if you are working from home or have that a bit of downtime. This is the best time to do that. Um, you know, it, it has has impacted the program in the sense that we have moved virtually. We were able to do this quite quickly within a 24 hour period. We've offered all of our students um, the uh, Zoom uh, Pro account. So we have covered that cost so that uh, we can ensure our students are technically, um, that they, they, they're secure in terms of their, uh, their technical uh, capabilities and that they can join classes on a daily basis. Um, all of our students are, are actually uh, working really quite collaboratively and working very well uh, during this time. Kingston is a small city, so we've, we've been impacted a lot less than the major cities, so we have no active cases currently in the city. Um, however, we are being, you know, quite cautious and there are no in-person classes at the moment. Um, but in regards to some of the, the changes we are going to be making, um, obviously our corporate recruitment has moved all to virtual platforms. We've actually embedded um, some new technology for corporates to be able to network with our students in smaller group settings. This is all going to be industry specific. And so we do have all of the top employers still interested in recruiting our students. So we are hoping that this will um, continue over the next few months. Um, there will be no corporate recruitment on campus this year. However, like I said, um, corporates are still very engaged and interested in seeing our talent. They are being sent all of our student resumes and are connecting students as early as this time frame. So, you know, our students will be, um, you know, part of some networking events, virtual chats, coffee chats, and things like that, um, all online. But we are providing all of the resources to ensure our students are going to be successful in those uh, meet and greets. 
So how are candidates assessed for scholarships? So I walked through this briefly and really it's just on merit based. So we do not unfortunately have any needs based scholarships, but we do have some specific donor based scholarships. So I do, do recommend that you check out our website to learn a little bit more about how you might um, be how they might be applicable towards your, your profile or how you can uh, best seek out those opportunities for funding, but there is no separate scholarships. Uh, no separate application rather for scholarship. When you apply to us, we're assessing you at the same time for scholarship as we are for acceptance. So everyone is assessed equally. And again, it's by merit. How can a candidate stand out? So some of the tips um, that I left you with earlier, I'll just reiterate. So things like accomplishments, both inside of work and outside of work. We wanna see team-based experiences. We are a team-based MBA. If you've been passionate about something, have an interest or a hobby, please ensure you put that on your resume. That's something that will help you stand out and will showcase a little bit of your personality and what value add on top of the skills you're bringing to the table that will be um, interesting in a program like ours and how you can uh, maybe work better in a team from those experiences. So these are the kinds of things that will make you stand out. Um, we also see, you know, candidates that have volunteered or sat on a board, uh, maybe they've mentored, lots of different ways in which you can showcase that leadership potential. And those are all the things that will make you stand out as an applicant. And it doesn't hurt, of course, to have a really strong GMAT as well. So how has the Smith recruitment process changed? Well, um, first and foremost, we are not accept we, we are lenient on accepting official documents. So we understand that things like transcripts and the West translation for international students may take some time. So we are very lenient towards that and we will only require official documents if you've been enrolled into the program. So you will have up to the start of the program to submit those. So we are giving some leniency on that time frame. Um, however, we are still requiring the GMAT. So the standardized test is mandatory. Uh, however, you don't need it to start an application and we will in some cases provide conditional offers. So I hope for the most part that this has answered some of your questions. I am going to just uh, quickly run through some of the questions that I see here um, and maybe uh, some of them uh, are in relation to, to Admit Master or, or Sergey's program. So please feel free to ask any and all of your questions. I'm going to flip this slide back to my contact um, so that you can jot that down or that you can see some of our quick facts as I uh, help to answer your questions within the next few minutes. So Sergey, I'll jump into some of these questions. I see some of them are for, for me here. So what is the minimum amount of work experience required for the executive MBA? So the minimum is six years, but the requirement is five years of management in people or projects. The average years of work experience sits at around 15 years. Uh, so if you do have um, you know, significant years of management experience, that's gonna be a great option for you, but the minimum is five years. Are there any external MBA scholarships other than Forte Foundation that you recommend we apply to? Uh, yeah, there's going to be some, there is some uh, government uh, funding. So I do recommend that you check out Edu Canada and go on to um, the Canadian government uh, website. Um, there's some great opportunities there for both domestic and international students. Some very unique country uh, scholarships as well, specific to you as uh, some countries. Um, and of course, you know, the loans are really the best way to, uh, to help fund um, the cost of an MBA. So those are really the, you know, through scholarships and government funding as well as grants and bursaries through the institution itself, uh, which are primarily for domestic students as well as loan options, I would say are the best ways to, to consider um, how you would fund this. Does someone from a volunteer organization count as a professional reference? Absolutely. References can come from mentors. They can come from clients. Um, if you've been part of any organization in, in which somebody has seen you in a work capacity, um, they are going to be great references to you. So again, anywhere where they can, you can showcase leadership or that you uh, are taking initiative to um, bolster yourself in, in terms of professional or personal development is going to be a great reference to use. All right, a couple more coming through here. Are we automatically considered for a Forte Foundation scholarship and other scholarships? 
and the scholarships when we apply or is there a separate application for scholarships there is no separate application so you are automatically every woman is automatically considered for a forte uh, fellowship and scholarships are all assessed upon um, acceptance into the program so when you apply to the program and we're assessing you in the admissions committee um, we're talking about scholarship at the same time so if you are offered uh, a seat in the program then you will hopefully at the same time be offered a scholarship if not there are ways where you can can be reassessed. So let's say on the first go you were offered an acceptance, however you weren't offered a scholarship. If in the interim there's something that maybe you didn't highlight or you didn't express um, that you'd like the admissions committee to know about you, or if you're taking you know, a designation um, and you've secured that, then we are always happy to revisit uh, your application and re-review your scholarship. And in most cases what we find is, is candidates will retake the GMAT. Um, the standardized test is a great way to to sort of bolster your quantitative ability for us to see um, that you've taken the initiative to improve your skills and and that's a great way to be reassessed as well all right does someone from a volunteer oh i think i've already answered that one uh, does the executive mba to, uh, program tuition include a tra travel stipend uh, if so what does it cover so the executive mba is an all-inclusive tuition fee the only expenses that you would need to pay is your travel to and from kingston for residential sessions so the executive mba program is across canada we have boardrooms in vancouver calgary edmonton montreal ottawa and three locations in the toronto gta area you physically come to a boardroom for classes bi-weekly for the residential sessions you are required to be in kingston and those happen three times in the year your tuition covers your food and your accommodation. You have to find your own way there. As someone who lives and works in Calgary and has three years of work experience, do you have any MBA programs that don't require me to move? <laughs> well, we do. Uh, we, ought, we do have um, programs in Calgary. We do have a facility in Calgary. Uh, we've been there for over 20 years now. Um, our programs in Calgary include our executive MBA program, which requires five years of management experience, and our executive Americas program, which is a combined degree with the uh, Cornell Johnson School of Management, similar uh, requirements uh, that you'll see in the national executive program and lastly we do also have um, an accelerated MBA program accelerated MBA program is for business undergrads so if you do have an undergraduate degree in business BCom or BBA then you will qualify for that program and the minimum years of work experience for that are uh, is two is two years are there any external MBA scholarships other than Forte I think I've already answered that so I think that concludes the, we said the, there are a couple there are a couple of questions in the chat box as well. There was a question with that uh, from Fabrice, do you accept application without a bachelor's degree, but the 15 years of experience up to the responsibilities of general manager? Yeah, so for the EMBA, absolutely, yeah. And that profile sounds like a great fit for an EMBA. <laughs> you do not need an undergraduate degree to apply to the executive MBA program. That program on average is 15 years of work experience and the only requirement is five years of management, people or projects. There was a question, th thank you, Teresa. There was a question from Kobe um, on a comment on the part-time MBA done from Montreal while working. I think you've already addressed this, but uh, if there's anything else that you'd like to add. Um, Sorry, the question was if we have programs in Montreal? Yeah, the question was, can you comment on the part-time MBA done from Montreal while oh, working? Sure. Um, that's sure. what the question asked. So if you, Kobe, if you want to follow up with the more detailed question, what exactly would you like to know, let us know. Yeah, I can just quickly just mention it's a it, their part time program they're what we consider professional programs out of Montreal, um, both the executive MBA options as well as the accelerated. So we have three MBA options out of Montreal, and those are all delivered uh, while you work. So the idea is that you come to classes on the weekends, um, depending on the program, uh, you know, they're offset. So one starts on Friday, one starts on Saturday, and one starts on Sunday. And classes are delivered bi weekly. What's your policy? There's a question from Amanda. What's your policy on admission deferrals? Yes. So, um, you know, this is going to be a unique year. <laughs> and so um, we suspect that um, due to COVID, we will have more requests for deferrals. And so we are going to be quite lenient on that. Um, typically, we would require in writing um, 
why you know the reason for deferral and your scholarship if you were awarded one gets put back into the pool and you're reassessed for scholarship the following year as you can imagine the budget is per year and so uh, we can't carry forward any scholarship decisions so we are um, again lenient towards offering deferrals there has to be um, it has to be a request in writing and uh, again the scholarship is going to be reassessed There's also a follow-up question. Is there a difference in starting salary between those who take the EMBA Americans and the, uh, Part, the regular the, EMBA? Yeah, the full-time. Yeah, there is. Um, there's going to be a considerable difference. Um, one, one primary difference is that uh, no one is quitting their job and relocating to Kingston in the executive option. So they're continuing to get a salary and most of them are in senior level or executive positions. So they're, you know, making well over um, our average starting salary in, in most cases. Of course, that's not in every case, but coming out of our MBA, the average is 130, just under $130,000. At an executive level, level um, you know, they're making, uh, you know, well over that. But uh, we don't calculate that because everyone is working during, you know, the time that they're in the executive MBA for the most part. Um, either, you know, most of them are working full-time, um, but you do have to be working in some capacity uh, as it's an applied program. So the executive options are really about taking the experiences that you're living um, and bringing those to the boardroom on a, you know, on a bi-weekly basis. So, you know, the, the reality is, is they're just very different programs um, for different ages and stages in someone's career. Do you see a big difference in the profile of people who are uh, joining the global program, the Americas program versus the, um, the EMBA, the, the more the domestic the Smith and yeah, EMBA? Yeah, so the, the real um, difference is that it's more diversified from an international perspective. So the national program is really just um, domestic candidates across Canada, whereas that whereas uh, the EMBA Americas program has students from obviously the Americas. Uh, so Latin America, both in um, from our side, we recruit in Santiago, Chile and in Lima, Peru. And then Cornell uh, recruits across the U.S. So it's 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 a lot more international in comparison to the EMBA Americas. So, um, or EMBA National rather. So the EMBA, if you are looking to, you know, work in the U.S. or you have connections in the U.S. or you already work for a U.S. company, the EMBA Americas is going to be a great option um, because your network is both in Canada and in the U.S. and of course into Latin America. Whereas the EMBA National is across Canada. Thank you, Teresa. There's also one more question. And uh, what I also would like to encourage you, um, everybody who's ans answering questions, if you have a lot of very specific questions to Teresa, please feel free to connect mm -hmm. directly. I've, put, I've pasted an email address for Teresa here in the chat box. Um, and uh, we are actually going to send you, you actually see it here on the screen, and we'll send you a follow-up email tomorrow with the links to all of these resources, and we'll be sure to include in uh, Teresa's contact information as well, so that you can connect directly and answer any of the specific questions. Mm -hmm. But maybe just one question that's a little more specific that we can answer right now, Teresa, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, what percentage of curriculum is case-based? Mm. Depends there, on the course. Yeah, it depends on the course, but we're definitely about 75% case-based generally, um, but our program is a blended uh, methodology. So there's not one way that we feel is best to teach you. Uh, you do get um, subsequent um, exercises in what we call distinctly case, which is really uh, formulated around um, students getting more hands-on experience with a third party. So we work with VOCA Prep. VOCA Prep was started by an ex-McKinsey uh, uh, management consultant, and he comes in uh, and does what we call distinctly case. So it's all included in the part of uh, your tuition. So this is not for, I believe we're the only MBA program in the country that actually includes it as part of the tuition cost. It's a great value add if you are looking to work in management consult consultants uh, or working in consulting in general rather um, and so you are getting the case methodology but you're also getting an opportunity to work with uh, real businesses and our real world business projects it's really about experiential learning this blended format uh, has um, in our opinion uh, really secured these top numbers in terms of our employment because it's not just focused on one thing we're really developing you personally and professionally Thank you so much, Teresa. Uh, again, I appreciate that you've, uh, that you've joined us here at this late hour to share these tips with us and with everybody here on this webinar. So thanks again. And thanks everybody for uh, joining us again and for sticking around. 
uh, you are going to have to uh, have some decisions to make. You're going to uh, have to look at what uh, you've learned here and see how you could um, move forward. What I would like to encourage you to do is if you are seriously considering potentially applying to the Smith School of Business, please do connect with um, Teresa, connect with the counselors. And if you are thinking of um, uh, joining the Smith School or any other school, then please uh, come and join us in our next classes. As the first step, uh, you could go on smith.trygmat.com and take a practice test, see where you're starting from. I know some of the questions that we've done today, you may have felt um, good about some of the questions, you might have been a little more frustrated. Once you learn how to do these questions, the GMAT is going to become a lot more manageable. But you can try it, you can assess your first level, and uh, then uh, go to admitmaster.com slash offer. Remember, for the first three people who register for the June classes, you're going to get, be getting $200 off. Uh, and uh, once you book your seat, we are going to call you. We're going to talk in depth about your plan. And then we will invite you. Uh, if uh, there is a good fit with our program, then we'll invite you to book your seat. So by going to this uh, website, you are not yet committing to the program uh, because we would also like to know how serious you are. So it's a, it's a two-way commitment. We want to make sure you will really committed because then we will be committed to you and we'll work with you until you get that score and we'll have that structure accountability and make sure that you walk away with some really amazing skills. So please connect with us, connect with us, connect with Teresa. And if there is anything else that we can do to help you, please let us know. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for listening in. And I appreciate the opportunity, Sergey. All the best. Have a good night.